A few months ago, I was seriously preparing myself for years of doom and gloom. The coronavirus pandemic seemed like a never-ending void that we were rushing into with all the toilet paper we could carry. But I've stopped caring. Something that reassures me about this whole thing is, even with something as horrible as the coronavirus, it's only so long before you stop worrying and it slips into the background like the rest of the stuff I'm meant to care about. I no longer check the death count daily. I don't read the latest horror stories of people abusing the guidelines, or the horrible situation in care homes. As horrible as it is, and as real as the threat still is, it's simply impossible to remain at high alert about something forever. Let me be clear about this. I SHOULD still be placing groceries in a quarantine pile, washing my clothes daily and cleaning my hands as thoroughly and as frequently as I can, but I just don't. I've gotten out of some bad habits, like touching my face so frequently. And I do wash my hands after touching something in a public place. But if I'm anything to go by, in the long run, this pandemic will do nothing more than to raise hygiene standards to closer to where they should have been in the first place. I wonder if this indifference would happen in a zombie apocalypse. Sure, for a few months you'd be sleeping with one eye open and clutching a knife, but how long before you're day drinking in the danger zone, eating without washing your hands, or blasting music from your speakers again? One thing we have gotten better about is masks. Even though we're still being told that we don't need to wear them because they're ineffective in some way or another, I'm still not wearing one myself because I consider buying them to be the same level of crime as stockpiling toilet paper was a few months ago. But if you're to wear one in a public place, then you won't be judged by anyone anymore. Shoppers commonly wear them, and I feel more comfortable being around people who do. In this, my third coronavirus diary entry, England has left lockdown. Was it ever a full lockdown? No. Is this fully leaving it? Not really. We've simply gone from stay at home unless you must, to you can go out, but be careful. If that sounds a bit vague, you know it about as well as I do. Here's the official guidance you can see for yourself. Stay alert gives you a lot of room for interpretation. I would describe it as everything's normal, only social gatherings, parks and restaurants are still mostly closed, and you've got to be seen making a noticeable effort to walk around people on the street. Unfortunately for you, this is when my life as a YouTuber works against me, because even when things are normal, I don't see much of the outside world. Pandemic or not, my life comprises of sitting at home until I need to buy more food. Shops still have those queues outside and people counting how many people are in them at all times. I saw one employee with a social distancing t-shirt on. The toilet roll shortage is over, but squirty soaps are still out, and my preferred spaghetti brand appear to be temporarily discontinued in favour of more space for beans. I'm sorry, this is my life. In Asda, at least, my choice for tin spaghetti is restricted to expensive stuff like Heinz. Their slogan has never been more appropriate. I'm still not meeting up with friends. Online, it still seems more active than usual, but outside, traffic seems almost back to normal again. That's something I'll miss. It was lovely when the roads were so quiet that they doubled as extra wide pavements. If there's one thing I'm worried about, it's the well-being of my older relatives. Of course, it would be horrible if they got infected, but even without that, they're lonely. They're expected to hide away for god knows how many more weeks. If they follow procedures like they're supposed to, that's months without social contact. And these are the people who are least acquainted with technology. I don't know where Zoom came from, but group video calls have become the primary form of social contact. I've dusted off the old webcam and have socialised with friends and family this way. We've refined the art of Zoom quizzes, where each person thinks up about 10 questions and everybody else in the chat has to post their answers at the same time. Of course, it's easy to cheat at, and if you make your quiz difficult, it gives you the best chance of winning overall. But guess what? Nobody cares, nor do they deliberately abuse it. And that's a refreshing change from the cutthroat attitude of internet activity that I'm used to. It's social interaction for the joy of social interaction. I have no idea how active coronavirus is anymore. In the earlier days, you could look at the total infection rate and think, yeah, most of them must still be active. But most of them must have recovered by now. Or died. Since the start of this, England has appeared worse affected than most other countries because we haven't tracked recoveries. You get somewhere like France with 40,000 documented recoveries, and then England would be there with 300. It was quite amusing to watch, really. These days, it's America and Russia that are competing for the most infections. But since England acknowledged a problem sooner, with the rest of Europe, it was Italy and Spain that we kept a close eye on, as being the countries that were worst affected by this. In the early weeks, when everything about the disease was unknown, their infection counts were horrifying. But last month, their rates started to level off, while ours didn't. 
we spent most of April playing catch up, and early this month we finally overtook them to have the most infections and deaths in Europe. Then the very next day, the government eased the lockdown. You can't make this stuff up. I took this comparison of infections at around that time so you can see how we were doing. Most countries really showed signs of levelling off, but England was still shooting up with no signs of stopping. I'm not saying we're wrong for ending lockdown, I'm assuming the government's experts will know more about the situation and have forecast the future better than I could hope to. I'm just saying that, as has been the case all along, we're continuing to take a much less cautious approach than other countries. A few months ago other countries were locking down, while England seemed to delay, eating into their time advantage until things got equally bad here before considering a shutdown. And now if any country is going to be easing the lockdown based on these graphs, it should be any of these but England. And yet here we are again, one of the last to lock down, yet one of the first to reopen. I know there's a delay in these statistics by a few weeks, but we're still behind or ahead of other countries in all the wrong ways. I watched the announcement about the end of lockdown live. England established a long-term R number tracking thing to continually monitor the outbreak and to open and to close things accordingly based on how bad things were. I don't think many people knew about our numbers at the start of this year, but by now everybody knows the importance of flattening the curve and about keeping that R number below 1 to ensure the infection numbers continue to drop. It's clear the coronavirus will continue to impact our lives for many more months, if not years, so it's good we've got a system in place to stay on top of developments. It's apparent from England's obsession with not being in lockdown that we're not looking to eradicate the disease. I think that's wishful thinking since it only takes one person on one flight to start the whole thing again so it makes sense to instead try to keep it under control until either a vaccine is discovered or until herd immunity is reached. I think Sweden's gone even more extreme in this direction, concluding that enough of the residents in their capital city have been exposed to it already that herd immunity isn't far away, and England's jealous of this and wanting to follow in their footsteps. Something I hope I've conveyed in these videos is confusion. Early on it was about how this thing spread, and how long things could remain contaminated for. Now the big questions are, does getting it lead to immunity, and how many of us have been exposed to it already? I'm still not clear on whether most people show symptoms, or if most of us have had it and not even realised. I really hope it's the latter because I don't want to be sick from it, but then I think, well if I've had it, could I have been responsible for infecting anybody else with it? As a YouTuber I think I'm a dead end option for the virus to take, unless somebody's hiding in my cupboard. In which case I'm sorry. No doubt this video will age quickly, and people love to claim that they knew all along with hindsight, but I think it's fair to say that questions regarding immunity remain unknown for the time being. Why can't tests be nice? Why can't I have my cheek swabbed or to pee in a cup or something? Why does it have to involve a blood test or something big being shoved up my nose so far it's practically scraping my brain? I have not been tested yet, but reports I've heard range from it being uncomfortable to being really, really unpleasant. How do they get you? Do they randomly stop you in your car for testing? Do they knock on your door? And so on. The UK got a lot of flack for not testing enough people early on, but from what I've heard, a lot of these tests are unreliable or inconclusive, so maybe we were right on that occasion. That being said, the government promised to step things up to 100,000 tests a day by the end of April, and they managed this with botching of the figures, and then it immediately dropped back down again for the start of May. A pandemic is an excellent opportunity for governments to up how much surveillance and control they have over the people, so I'm keeping tabs on two developments. The first is a contact tracing mobile app to track your location to inform you if you've been exposed. This is currently voluntary and in limited trials for now. And the second new measure is this five tier system which will tell you how much freedom you have to go about your daily business. Don't get me wrong, both are excellent ideas if you want to control a pandemic and both are terrifying measures if used for other means. So for now, we have these things, whereas a few months ago, we did not. I think about two people I know in real life have had the coronavirus, but I only know that because I did some Facebook stalking the other day. I know a few people online who have had it as well, and they said it was absolutely horrible, and the breathing issues, scary. I always thought this whole thing would drag on for months and years, but I guess everybody expects to get it in the first few weeks, and hence the panic. I think my chances of getting it now are as high as ever, but like I said, I have reached acceptance, and have reduced how much I worry about it to a lower, more sustainable, and healthier level.